I'm Dean Walker, and welcome to the Poetry of Predicament podcast, a podcast for people brave enough to face humanity's challenges and problems, and most importantly, our numerous predicaments. The Poetry of Predicament is a podcast meant to inspire us to bring forth grace, beauty, and connection with the web of life in the face of a predicament-laden world. This week in the Poetry of Predicament podcast, this is a special engagement in which we're uh, relaying a recording from Sean Chamberlain's uh, remarkable core online course, Surviving the Future, and his extensive work in continuing the work of David Fleming and Lean Logic. His guest in this interview is David Abram, himself one of the most remarkable uh, authors and uh, philosophers, if you will, uh, in the world today. So I uh, hope you enjoy this extraordinary conversation with David Abram and Sean Chamberlain. So welcome everybody to week seven's guest session, which is our penultimate session. And this week we are joined by David Abram, who is another of our guests with an unusually varied background, I would say, uh, as a, a cultural ecologist and a philosopher, but also a sleight of hand magician, uh, which is a skill that he's used to, to trade magic with indigenous sorcerers around the world. He is the author of Becoming Animal, an Earthly Cosmology, and The Spell of the Sensuous, Perception and Language in a More Than Human World, uh, which is a book that was profoundly influential on me. Um, he also shares with me a background in direct action defense in of, of the said more than human world. Uh, and he's the founder creative director of the wonderfully acronymed Alliance for Wild Ethics in his home terrain of New Mexico. And also an excited recent discoverer of David Fleming's work as I've been delighted to hear that we've been preparing for this. Um, just as a reminder to you all that this will be a, a two hour session at David's request and invitation uh, and as ever um, if questions or thoughts come up for you during David's initial presentation then post the questions in the chat and um, we will bring them in for the conversation later so with that said I'll hand over to you David great thank you Sean and very good to see all you folks um, I'm here in northern New Mexico, upper Rio Grande Valley, in the foothills of the Sangre de Cristo Mountains, which just got blessed by an amazing gift of snow. This white grace that descends from the heavens, muffling all the sharp sounds, easing all the harsh boundaries in the land, and generally sending people like me into a, a trance of ecstatic wonder and, and, and joy at it all. Um, this last weekend got to be uh, up skiing in the back country with my two kids, just a, a little ways north of here over the border in Colorado. And so I'm feeling invigorated and and yeah, really delightful uh, uh, to to be here with you folks. I thought maybe I'd start with a with a simple story. I used to tell uh, it all the time because it was uh, an encounter I had in my life, but um, I haven't told it in years. Um, but I was thinking, yeah, what kind of stories can possibly come across um, in the uh, over the screens of the internet. Um, I'll give this a try. I hope it's visible. Um, I'll just step back here. Can you all see me okay? Hear me okay still? Yeah, it's great. All right, great. So um, I was walking back down from the upper yak pastures to the small Sherpa village where I'd been staying with a, a Sherpa Zonkri or medicine person, uh, when I noticed this huge boulder that the Zonkri himself had pointed out to me some days earlier 
as a place where he went to dance before attempting any particularly difficult cures. And so when I saw that boulder, um, I walked over to it and I stepped out on it, uh, not to dance, but to ponder the crinkly black and orange lichens slowly spreading on its surface and to gaze out across the gorge to the next wave of the Himalaya, these huge snow-capped and ice-decked peaks. And beneath me, this boulder you see was jutting out over this huge, way far below River Gorge. And way down there was this blue ribbon of river reflecting the blue sky overhead and the hiss from that river was also reaching my ears. I, um, so I settled down on this rock. I better not do it here or you won't see me. Uh, just cross-legged um, and I took a coin out of my pocket. Uh, it was uh, a Nepali coin, kind of a large one. Uh, this is, this is a, just a half dollar, but I started doing this aimless sleight of hand exercise, rolling the coin over the knuckles of my hand. Um, I had taken to practicing this uh, in response to the endless flicking of prayer beads by the elder Nepali Sherpas. They're always, they've got these rosaries of beads and and they're always moving one bead after another through their hand. And each bead, as it goes in, um, carries the prayer, uh, Om Mani Padmi Hum. So they're, they're chanting this prayer, Om Mani Padmi Hum, Om Mani Padmi Hum, Om Mani Padmi Hum, steadily as they're uh, moving the beads through their hands. As many of you know, Om Mani Padmi Hum uh, means, well, it's, its exoteric meaning is, ah, the jewel in the lotus. Ah, the jewel in the lotus. Ah, the jewel in the lotus. The esoteric meaning would be, ah, the penis in the vagina. Ah, the penis in the vagina. Ah, the penis in the vagina. But this is the cosmic penis in the cosmic vagina that, <clears throat> that is continually conceiving and giving shape, form, birth to all the 10,000 things around us at every moment, continually surging up out of the invisible. Ah, the penis in the vagina, ah. Um, so I have to admit there was no prayer accompanying my coin, however, just um, that ringing blue sky overhead and the lichens under my bottom the rock, the boulder, and, and yeah, that sky was glimmering. It was as if it was a huge bell and the sun was the clapper in that bell. To my side of those peaks across the gorge were two birds, um, huge birds, it turns out. They didn't look that big at the moment. Lammergeiers is what they're, called uh, an immense sort of condor or vulture. The, uh, the wingspan can be over 10 feet. They're immense. But they were looking quite uh, graceful there, the two of them soaring in the distance. And as I was watching them, one of those birds started winging out from its partner in the distance and just soaring in a wide arc across the gorge, turning and turning until it, it almost seemed like it was heading toward the boulder where I was sitting. Huh. So I stopped rolling the coin and just stared at it. But at that moment, uh, the Lammergeier swerved around and began soaring in a straight line back toward its partner in the distance. Dang, shucks. I took up the coin, began rolling it over my knuckles again, letting its shiny surface 
I now realize, reflect the late afternoon sun's rays back up into the sky, because as soon as I started rolling this coin over my knuckles again, that winged swerved out from its trajectory and began soaring in that wide arc over the canyon, turning and turning until, yeah, seemed to be heading toward the boulder where I was sitting. No, it didn't seem to be heading toward the boulder. It was heading right toward this boulder. And you know, when something is coming straight toward you out of the distance, you don't really see anything move. You just kind of see it grow and get larger and larger. And as the immense size of this bird became apparent, I began to hear this humming in my ears and my skin started to crawl and come alive like a community of bumblebees all in motion. And that humming in my ears got louder and louder as this visitation became more and more imminent as this bird got closer, closer and closer until it was there, stopped hovering about 10 feet over my head, huge wing feathers rustling as they mastered the breeze. And then I felt myself stripped naked by this alien gaze, 10 times more lucid than my own. I have no idea for how long it was I was in this trance. Only that I felt the wind rushing past my ears and, and pouring through my feathers long after the visitor had departed. Because I really had this sense, really and truly, of um, feathers having sprouted from my upper, the uppermost part of my arms and the uppermost part of my legs, just the tops of my thighs, and this wind was rushing in them. Whoosh, 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 and in my ears, loud. And I'm looking around and there's no wind around me at all. Not a blade of grass or a speck of dirt is moving. And then I caught sight of the visitor now halfway back across the canyon, soaring back toward its partner in the distance. Yeah, well, I am a, uh, a cultural ecologist um, and I'm also a philosopher or what some folks call a geophilosopher. That is someone who is working out uh, the ways of thinking um, under the influence of the more than human earth. Um, another way I might say it is, you know, one of those folks, I'm sure there are others among you, maybe each of you in your own way, working out the styles of thought and ways of wielding our words um, that are needed on the far side of this bottleneck that uh, we seem to be going through. This metamorphosis in history that we might call, you know, a sort of end of linear time um, because linear time or history is beginning to blossom. You can imagine that sort of linear stem of a wildflower, um, but you're in that stem or you're in that flow of linear time. So you're looking down into the flower and that's as that stem is beginning to open and blossom back into the space around it. That is history folding back into story and the cycling of time the breathing of the land and the cosmos in its innumerable small and large cycles around us. Um, what are the ways of speaking that are calling to us, 
the ways of reflection, the forms of experience, the forms of uh, of taste and touch and smell. I I should say that my my work as an ecologist um, focuses first and foremost on the ecology of sensory experience. Um, I'm fascinated with sensory experience or perception, largely from my earlier craft or profession that Sean spoke of as a sleight of hand magician. Uh, perception is the medium for magicians as pigments are the medium for a painter. Um, whether a traditional indigenous sorcerer or a contemporary uh, sleight of hand conjurer, um, Magicians are those who work with the malleable textures of perception, uh, who know that um, perception is far more fluid and metamorphic than uh, we tend to assume, and that much more than we've also been educated to think. So magicians are adept at altering that medium of perception itself. Um, when I say my fascination with the ecology of sensory experience, what I mean is thinking of the eyes, the ears, the skin, the nostrils, um, that the activity of our nose, of our tongue, of our ears functions as a kind of uh, binding element or a glue that binds our separate nervous systems into the encompassing ecosystem. That perception or sensory experience is, is this, this fine filamental web that binds our individual nervous systems into the wider ecosystem around us. But I'm also just as engaged with and known for my work on the ecology of language um, or the ways in which what we say so profoundly influences what we see or what we hear or even taste of the earth around us. Because I'm convinced that there are ways of speaking that many or most of us have inherited from the goofy civilization into which we've been born, ways of speaking that actually frustrate and stifle the instinctive rapport between our bodily senses and the earthly sensuous. But I am just as convinced that there are, sometimes hiding, that there are other ways of speaking, other ways of wielding our words that can enhance and encourage that spontaneous reciprocity between our animal body and the animate earth. And it's those that I'm always hunting for, looking to suss out, experimenting with. Um, ways of speaking that alter our felt experience of the world. Um, so I hope that makes some kind of loopy sense. Um, and Sean, luckily I have you on my screen there. So if my image freezes or my words just freeze up, just start waving your hands and, um, and I'll get that there's something wrong. Um, or tell me, of course, hopefully I'll be able to hear you. So, geez, uh, so I, I have um, a bunch of little notes that I took here. Uh, but then at a certain point realized there's just, there's so much to, to say um, and that I'd better just, just wing it. Um, I know a key thing that I'm wanting to touch in about whether uh, in first in this rap or, uh, or in conversation with you all, um, something I want to lean into uh, is is the body and the centrality of the body or what we so easily call the body, though it's this utterly magical and um, mysterious 
chunk of matter uh, that seems to move, to breathe, to speak, to reflect within itself. Um, I want to suggest that in times like these, when things are getting tough, and then tougher still, when the situation is dangerous, and as it of course has been for many of our colleagues and comrades for a very long time, but as and whenever you feel this kind of danger closing in uh, around you, the risks are mounting, um, the unknowns are, um, uh, some of them are increasingly terrifying, whether due to pandemic, due to drought, flood, hurricane, um, predators, rather large predators out because you're hiking in the woods or the very small predators like COVID-19 insinuating themselves within your bloodstream. Um, it seems to me that the most powerful and most magical uh, strategy um, is to come as close to your physicality, to your body, or rather to begin identifying ever more deeply with your own animal uh, flesh and uh, dropping away the sense that you are in any useful sense, a mind uh, or a self or a consciousness that comes from somewhere else, some hidden realm behind the stars and descends into and takes up lodging within your skull, but that it's really helpful, at least at such moments, to drop that kind of a story and to allow that you are this body, that you are animal. Uh, an unusual animal, actually a very nifty animal for sure, the human, but an animal nonetheless, and hence in many ways, just one of the gang, uh, with so much in common with the other creatures of this place, of this realm, this land. Because to identify with your body is also then to wake up ever so many subtle sensory uh, uh, attunements to the subtleties uh, in the land, in the, in the place, in the situation where you find yourself. It's to wake up your animal senses. So they become much more heightened, much more aware, and so able to respond with much more nuance to the danger that's afoot. And um, I think this is a key uh, a key piece that I wanted to speak of because it goes, I believe, hand in hand with everything David Fleming and Sean have written about in this book and in Lean Logic, giving a new kind of primacy to the body. But I'm not speaking here of the body as a set of mechanisms, you know, uh, and, and the digestive system or the circulatory system or the respiratory system, these different mechanical systems that we see laid out on the pages of our physiology textbooks. No, I'm speaking of the body as a magical being. This one who thinks, senses, reflects, and calls out to others and sometimes bursts into song but to begin to take fresh new pleasure in your animality, in what you have in common with all the other critters, not just in common with other animals, but by virtue of being a body, you have something in common with every other organism. These trees that surround your home or your city, here the spruces, the ponderosa pines, the juniper trees that dot the red earth around here as I'm looking out my window, but the cottonwood trees, uh, each going through their own cycles, 
uh, drinking sunlight with their leaves or needles steadily while they are slurping up water through their roots or their toes. Um, to identify with one's physicality, with one's body, is to also begin to tap into what you share in common with the plant world, with the herbs, with the grasses, and with whole forests. But not even just that, because by virtue of being a body of density and weight, I am a thing among things. That is, I am made of the same stuff as all these other things around, including the mountains and the rivers and the winds and the weather patterns. So to allow yourself to be fully, fully here seems to me uh, a key strategy for the danger and weirdness of this wild moment in the world. And um, in speaking of that, well, I'll back up a little bit. I want to say that um, that well, of course, when we open to the body, David Fleming writes a certain amount uh, in this book. You folks have been reading about eroticism and eros, um, and I think I'd like that to thread through my my comments here or any conversation that that we have, because opening to the body is also opening to a range of, um, of pleasures and even ecstasies that we all too often keep at bay or shut ourselves off from. But I wanna say that the erotic in its deepest sense it lives in the relation between my body and the body of the earth because I'm always in relation with the broad body of the earth. And in my encounter with another person, uh, another human creature, uh, it's like we are both expressions of earth, but earth is encountering itself through us and getting excited, uh, getting moved. And that's a big part of what rolls through us when we are feeling these erotic energies um, is earth. I mean, if you think about it, um, I, in, in some ways our most immediate palpable relation with the earth, our most bodily relation is what is just this, this weirdness that if I um, pick up a stone from the ground and I heave it up into the air, wham, it hits the ground. And so me too, as a thing among things with a lot in common with that rock because I'm a body of density and weight. So if I leap up, I come right back down. Um, it's, it's this weird elastic thing that we've come to call gravity. Um, but you folks might remember when you were kids, just the pleasure you took in, uh, jumping, um, in, in, in walking and stumbling and sometimes falling down um, and making yourself trip and fall because of that, that, that strange attractive thing that holds your body to the earth. And when you leave the earth, wham, you fall right back upon it because, because well, it, it's kind of magical. It's like, it's like, it's almost like a rubber band phenomenon. I, I leap off the earth and it pulls me right back to itself. And I think I used to play with this magic as a child all the time, but I think all of us did. But if you want to take something genuinely magical and um, make it vanish from people's awareness, turn it into a law the law of gravity, the law of gravity. Ah, because then everything just 
automatically follows that law. Automatically. It has to. Mechanically, as it were, follows the law. And so you stop noticing it. Oh, that's just the law of gravity. Nothing much there. But what is that law? Um, if we uh, listen into our sister phys physicists, they will say things like gravity is the mutual attraction between bodies, often at a distance from one another, in inverse proportion to their masses, um, or in inverse proportion to their distance from one another. But always it has this mutuality in it. It's the mutual attraction between bodies. Now, it seems to me that that sounds a lot like Eros like Eros, the mutual attraction between bodies. That is, there is this ongoing mutual desire of my body for contact with the body of the earth and of the earth for my body. What if gravity is Eros? And the smaller allurements that we feel toward another person uh, walking on the other side of the street and something moves our, in our chest and we just feel like, oh, I wanna get close to that person. I'm trying to draw her near me or I can just sort of wander uh, across the street but without looking at her directly just to come close. But what if those, all those smaller attractions are just ripples on the surface of this vast ocean of eros, continually being felt between my body and the body of the earth, felt by the earth for my body, for contact with my body. Um, so I want us to, to ponder that. Um, I mean, we know, we know that love, has something to do with gravity because we speak of falling in love, right? I'm falling in love with her or gosh, I, I'm falling in love with you. It, there's this sense of falling involved with love. Um, but I wanna suggest that that's because what we speak of as love, particularly erotic or full body love, um, always draws on or is an expression of this much richer, fuller, erotic allurement that the earth has for my body and my body for the earth. But then of course that would imply that it's eros or bodily love that holds the moon to the earth and the earth to the moon. And that it's eros that holds the earth and the moon together in relation to the sun and the sun to the other stars in our galaxy and this Milky Way galaxy in its intense relation with the other galaxies out and about that it's Eros that that fires the cosmos itself and we get to taste of that and live through that in our erotic engagements. So yeah I think uh, I Gravity is key there. I'm also thinking of it because I got to be skiing this last weekend with my kids. And um, there's an erotic dance with gravity. Most people these days think of gravity as just a drag, you know, it holds you down, sticks you to the ground. Nah, think of skiing or, or if you surf, you know, body surfing or using a surfboard dancing with gravity and the waves. Um, there are so many styles and forms of indulging in that wondrous uh, erotic pleasure. Um, but gadzooks, I've wandered far afield. I wanna say something about um, perception and, and, and then drop into the matter of language a bit. Um, but I have a hair in my mouth. Um, the ecology of sensory experience, it seems to me that to our animal body, 
our most ordinary, normal human way of uh, experiencing the sensuous terrain around us. That, that is the world that our animal senses give us access to is of a world that is calling our gaze, capturing our attention, sometimes rebuffing us, but it's always active. Anything that draws my gaze or calls my attention so that I turn to face it, I'm responding to a call that came from that thing, even if it were uh, just a stone or a pebble on the ground, or I'm riding my bicycle here in the fall and passing various leaves that are stuck to the ground, but then one brightly colored autumn leaf. It just snags my, my eyes. It wants something of me. And so I swung my bicycle around and got off and picked up that leaf. And in response to my picking it up, it revealed something more of itself. I could see the other side of it, which was even brighter in that orange yellow color. Um, and so there's a kind of conversation without words that perception involves. Something catches your gaze, you turn towards it, it reveals something more of itself, which invites you or induces you to uh, turn it over, um, which enables the other, the leaf in this instance, to reveal something more of itself. At every step, I'm in a kind of improvisational duet with anything that I perceive. This glass of juice in front of me here on the table, even the walls of my home, the clouded sky overhead, that perception is not a one-off thing. It's an ongoing dance, an interweavement between my body and the body of the world in which the world is just as active, just as much an agent as I am. And any part of the world, any particular cloud that I'm gazing at, any particular leaf or stone or mountain is an active, agential power that is dynamically engaging my animate body as well. That is to say, ordinary perception, our most direct immediate experience of the world is of a world that is alive through and through. Everything is animate, everything. Nothing is inert or inanimate, or we wouldn't be able to see or feel or perceive it in any way whatsoever. Things have to engage us, grab us, call our attention. So from my body's perspective, everything is alive. Everything is alive, awake, even perhaps aware. And that this is ordinary for us, that this is normal for the human animal is attested by the discourse of pretty much every indigenous oral culture we know of, all of whom affirm the world as radically alive through and through and through, uh, nothing inanimate. Yet, um, yeah, so I think that's one basic point I want to put out there, that animism, which is simply uh, the term that the earliest anthropologists came up with for the, the, the perceptual style or the experiential style of pretty much every indigenous oral culture we encountered or know of. Uh, they are so different from one another. These cultures are so radically diverse and divergent. Often they seem like they inhabit different universes in their belief systems and life ways. And yet, and yet there are these curious commonalities. One of which is this sense that everything is alive, not just the other animals and the plants, but the stones, the ground itself, the mountain, the river streaming down that mountain, the dry riverbed when those waters have dried up, the winds and the weather power, 
the winds, which you can't even see directly, but you feel them. Clouds, storm clouds, words that we might speak have their own lives, particular stories, dance and play out there in the world. Nothing is inanimate. And I wanna suggest that this is a way of speaking that is so old in us and so basic to us that once you begin to indulge it again, I mean, try it on, but as you do notice how much it wakes up your senses, that your eyes become more awake to the display of the other beings around you because they're no, no longer just there. They're actually being resplendent. They're actually dancing. They're actually displaying something, something of their life, their way of being, even if it's a cliff face. Um, or, and how much more you hear of the world. Because, yeah, again, as diverse as our indigenous allies are and, and the indigenous native traditions, even just on my continent here in North America, so different from one another. But there's this other commonality, not just that everything is alive, but that everything speaks. It's just that most things don't speak in words, but everything speaks, has its eloquence. Some things speak in uh, cricket rhythms. Bird song, of course, is a kind of speech. Wolf howls, for sure. But even the wind in the willows is a kind of voice. Um, I, uh, uh, years ago, in the Pacific Northwest, went to visit a cat that I had heard um, had schooled himself, steeped himself in the dialogue in, in the dialect, uh, in the languages of all of the local forest trees, most of them needled trees, but many, many, many different ones in that, uh, in that decid in, in the rainforest of uh, the coastal Northwest. And so I just want to mention this quickly. Um, uh, a couple of us took him out in a pickup truck. Uh, it was a a local man and myself, but we blindfolded this elder guy first and then took him in the pickup truck and we drove around and around on different roads and in circles until we came to a spot where we stopped, parked the truck, took him out still blindfolded uh, 50, 60 yards into the woods and planted him underneath one big old tree, uh, needled tree. And um, without taking off the, the blindfold, he just stood there for about a minute and announced to us the exact tree that is the exact species of that uh, needled being, of that evergreen. Um, and I found this astonishing. Uh, but he listens so attentively to the way and the speech of the, uh, of the breeze through those needles. So I was telling this tale once a few years ago, and somebody in the audience got very adamant and said, Abram, give me a break. That is not the voice of the tree, nor the dialect of the tree. The tree itself isn't speaking. That's just the wind blowing through the tree to which I had to just think for a moment. And I said, uh, yes, my friend, but do you really think it's any different when you speak? It's just the wind blowing through. We only speak by inhaling some of this invisible gusting fluid and let it circulate within us. And then we breathe it out. And we shape it with our lips and our teeth and our palate and we sound it out into the world. Our voice is also just the wind blowing through. Anyway, though, for every indigenous place-based culture we know, everything speaks. It's not just that humans have meaningful speech, everything has meaningful speech, even the way the shadows shift across a cliff can move you, can inform your body. The blustering uh, voice of of a jet airplane overhead 
you know, monopolizing the whole soundscape. What does that speak? Of course, my body gets affected by that voice, by that speech easily. And it says something about, yes, the, uh, you know, the, the, the power and um, bluster of humankind at this moment and of our technologies to monopolize not just the soundscape, but every part of, of the breathing earth around us. So those two things that to wake up your senses, try allowing that everything is alive and that everything speaks, that any sound can be a voice. Any movement can be a gesture laden with expressive intent. But, but if this is, if this is really um, so basic and primordial to the human creature, then we might ask, how could we ever have lost this sensibility, this sensitivity, this awake, awakeful awareness of everything animate, everything alive, um, and that everything speaks. And so I, I want to draw slowly to a close here by saying, um, I think it's not a simple question, but there are some very key basic moments and points in the loss of this full-bodied awareness of a breathing, animate cosmos. Uh, the one I want to call your attention to is just, well, the fact that, that pretty much every place-based indigenous culture, whether we're speaking of the Koyakon people of central Alaska or the Hopi people of the desert east of here or the Puebloan peoples here where I live or the Warani people of, of the Amazon basin or the Kayapo of the Amazon um, or the Lakota of the plains or the Cherokee of the Eastern seaboard. Now many of them moved West, but or the Sami people of Northern Scandinavia or the Ogoni people of Nigeria or the Pintupi and Pichanjajara of Central Australia. All of these peoples as outrageously divergent and different as they are, these are all by and large oral cultures. That is to say, these are all cultures that have developed and flourished in the absence of any highly formalized writing system. Huh, so we might ask, what is it that writing and the written word does to our senses and to our sensory experience of the earth around us? And what is it that writing does to our experience of language and linguistic meaning? And so uh, I want to just, this is, this is a very complex sort of spider web of connected uh, matters. I just want to pluck a couple threads of this web so maybe you can feel the whole web vibrate and then we can have a conversation about this stuff. First, in a culture without writing, um, how, is, how is deep cultural memory preserved? How are the memories gathered by your ancestors, all the knowledge about how to survive in this land without screwing it up and where to find particular plants and which parts of those plants are toxic and how to detoxify them and how to prepare other parts for clothing or, or for food or for medicines and which parts of which plant are good for healing cramps and which ones for sleeplessness. All of that knowledge and much more besides has to be has to be preserved. How is it preserved in a culture without writing? Because for us, we just go to the bookshelf and we look up whatever it is we want to know. But in a culture without writing, how is all that preserved? Um, and um, um, I guess since you've all got your mute muted microphones on, I'll just say, um, well, the key, Peace, I would suggest, is story. 
that cultures without formal writing systems are cultures of story. Oral culture is the culture of face-to-face -face storytelling. But then, wait a minute. So what I'm saying is that the stories are the living encyclopedias of an oral culture. All of that rich, specific knowledge, place-specific knowledge gathered by your ancestors has to be held in stories. So um, it's like they're stored within the layers of stories. So then the second question arises, how is it then that the stories are remembered in a culture without books? Because I wanna know a good story, I'll go look it up or I'll pull off Grimm's fairy tales from my bookshelf and look up the particular story I'm looking for or another book or for this or that information. But how are the stories preserved in a culture without writing? And so let me um, invite you to ponder that for a moment um, while I gulp. It turns out that, um, and if anybody wants to unmute themselves and, and offer up a, a provisional answer here, please feel free to. But if oral cultures are cultures of story, the question, how are the stories remembered? Well, a key and the biggest key is that the stories are remembered because they're associated with particular things in the surrounding sensory world, um, like other animals. So why do animals figure so centrally in the tales of indigenous oral tradition peoples? Around here, stories of coyote, the trickster, stories of raven, stories of wolf, all of the big teaching stories central to this continent, North America, have animals as central figures. Um, and I could give you various examples, but not going to do that right here. But just to say, when you come upon the tracks of coyote, it then triggers one or another story within which coyote figures as a central character. Or when you see that flapping form of raven swooping by overhead again, it just triggers another story in which raven figures. So the animals are holding the stories in place, but not just the animals, the plants as well, big time. But most importantly, the fact is that the stories are associated with particular places in the land where those stories happened or where potent, particular events in those stories happen. And so when you come upon those places, as you go about gathering witchetty grubs or basil for your tea, and you see that cave mouth, it triggers a story about how that cave mouth came to be there or who sleeps in there, the bear denning inside, or you see that mountain edge or that river bend and it triggers a story that happened at that place. So let me give you an example of this. The American poet, my friend Gary Snyder, some of you surely know Gary's work, was traveling in Australia some years ago um, in the Australian outback, his one time to Australia. And uh, he was visiting the uh, red center of Australia uh, and visiting the uh, Pichanjara people and visiting with a particular Pichanjara man named Grandfather Jimmy, Jimmy Chungarayi. And Jimmy was showing Gary some of the uh, open desert around there, driving his pickup and Gary sitting next to him in the pickup as Grandpa Jimmy is telling Gary some of the dream time stories about the wallaby women who are going along at that spot and bumped into some of the green ant people over there. Whoa, and they got into a major fight. And so the green ants went running up onto that hill over there where they bumped into the crocodile men and some fornication happened. And the crocodiles went running down this side and the green ants went running down that side. And he's telling the story so fast, so rapidly that Gary Snyder wanted him to slow down 
just kindly slow down so I can follow the story. Until suddenly Gary realized with a start, wait a minute, these stories are all originally meant to be told while walking. But they are riding in a pickup truck through the outback. And so they're passing very rapidly all of the sites where these stories happened. That is the, the intimacy between language and the land is so intense in a traditionally oral culture that you have to pace the speed of your speaking to the speed of your wandering through the terrain. That's how intimate that link between language and the land is. I'll give you one other example and, um, and then we'll go elsewhere or I'll open this up. Um, one other example from the same continent, if I can put my hand on it here. Um, let's see, oh, it's in this book. This is uh, from the same continent, Australia. Um, another uh, poet, is an Australian poet named Billy Marshall Stone King. He's a, a white poet, is again sitting in a pickup truck next to an old Aboriginal man. I don't know his name. Billy Marshall Stone King just calls him the oldest man in the world. And um, he, Stone King happens to have a tape recorder. And as they're moving through the country, he's got his tape recorder on. And this is part of what he records. This old guy says, see there, that tree is a digging stick left by the giant woman who was looking for honey ants. That rock, a dingo's nose. There on that mountain is the footprint left by Changara on his way to Ulambura. Here, the rock hole of Wernampi, very dangerous. And the, and the cave where the Ni Ni women escaped the anger of Ma Marapulpa, the spider. Whoa. Wati Kuchara, the two brothers, they traveled this way. There you can see one was tired from too much lovemaking, the mark of his penis dragging on the ground. Ooh, here are the, the bodies of the honey ant men where they crawled from the sand. No, they are not dead. They keep coming from the ground, moving toward the water at Warumpi. It has been like this for many years. The dreaming does not end. It is not like the white man's way. What happened once, happens again, and again, and again, and again. This is the law. This is the power of the songs. Through the singing, we keep everything alive. Through these stories, the places keep us alive. So you can get a little glimmer of a sense there of what it's like to live in a storied landscape where every bend in the river every cluster of rocks, every forest edge is sprouting with stories that tell themselves to you and through you as you wander through that terrain. Man, but think about just for a moment what happens when writing first comes into such a culture and the stories begin to be stripped off of the uh, clustered rocks and the river bends and written down on the page. For our oral ancestors, the living land was the primary mnemonic or memory trigger for remembering all of the ancestrally acquired linguistic information. The land was the, was the mnemonic, the places in the land the trees, the animals, the animal tracks. Once writing comes in, the page becomes the primary mnemonic for remembering all the old stories. And the living land begins to become superfluous to remembrance and to thinking. Now the stories can be read in distant cities and even on distant continents and all the place specific memory that once lived in those stories begins to be forgotten. And so we open a book of Grimm's fairy tales and we read about the, the little people who lived under uh, the mushrooms. And we think what an outrageously wild imagination these unlettered peasants had. But if we were still living out on that land, 
you know, our grandma might be tugging us uh, to just come outside, you know, saying, take a look at this one, Davy. Take a look here. Oh, he's a wise one. Do you see him? No, grandma, I don't see what. Look right there under that shroom. Look close, Davy. And you peer under that large mushroom and out comes sliding slug man with his antennae. And you begin to realize that these stories are about real beings and real events that happen out in the land. But in that original landscape, as the stories are pried off of all the rocks and mountains and rivers and planted on the page, the land no longer speaks its tales. And it's not that far from there to the land beginning to, to seem just a, a clutch of resources waiting to be used by us. Uh, just a standing reserve. Um, so I've wrapped long enough. Why don't I just um, open this up there? There's so much more I wanted to allude to, but maybe we'll, uh, we'll get there in, in conversation. I, I think the simple thought, uh, two simple thoughts I'm wanting to leave you with from what I was just saying, that to push a traditionally oral culture out of its ancestral homeland, well, the land itself is the very matrix of linguistic meaning for a non-writing culture. To push a traditionally oral culture out of their ancestral homeland, because you want to dam up that valley uh, for power, or you want to clear cut those forests. Well, it's tantamount to pushing them out of their mind because the land is the mind they think with. We think with our books. We think off the pages of our screens. Oral cultures think off of and in, in reciprocity with the terrain itself. And the last thought to leave you with there is that the rejuvenation of oral culture is an ecological imperative it seems to me this goes utterly hand in hand with everything that David Fleming is writing about in this astonishing uh, book, uh, which for me is truly a masterpiece, envisioning how we get to a livable future from here. One central key about convivial culture and vernacular culture and place-based culture is to realize that oral culture is the key. The culture of face-to-face -face storytelling is inherently local. And we must, I think, replenish the arts of face-to-face -face storytelling and even more so the art of face-to-place storytelling binding stories, rooting them back in the land, under rocks, in the canopy of the forest, letting the stories live around us in the land once again. I'm not saying we have to stop writing. I'm a writer. I love to read and I love the written word, nor that we have to throw out our computers or take them down to the dump or shoot them as my friend Ed Abbey felt, but rather, that we leave some space in our days for a sharing of language that is neither through the computer screen nor through the written word, but is just face-to-face -face sharing of stories. End of wrap. Thanks. Thank you, David. Um, I think what I'm left with from that is a is a profound sense of, of loss. Like when I think of the years I spent learning to read, like how weird it was to try and associate these symbols with first sounds and then ideas and just like the, the work of learning to read. Yes. And I think, you know, and then I think about your, your cat who was learning 
the language of the trees. And I think, gosh, you know, I could have, I, I didn't learn that as a child, you know, but other children in other cultures have, you know, they've, they've learned the language that isn't in books, that's in the land. And um, it's a sense of loss, but it's, it's also, I guess, quite naturally, that sense of loss births a longing, um, you know, births a longing to understand how, how we can, how I can get better at, at, at hearing those voices, at, at discovering the life that exists outside of books um, and relating with it. And, and as we've been talking a lot in this course about uh, the gift economy and, and reciprocities, like how we, how we extend that beyond the human um, and recognize the, the gift circles that we're in with, with our wider, more than human community. I don't know whether that, well, I'm sure that does prompt some thoughts for you and I'd love to hear them. From me or from the other folks gathered well, here? Well, from you, I mean, so what usually happens is that people post, um, post things in the chat if they'd like to, to raise things and a couple have come up. Um, and okay. I'll, I'll sort of pass those on to you as we, as we go through. Okay. Um, so yeah, from you, you know. Well, um, linking this back into um, the matter of magic, uh, which I was also referring to as animism early in my, my, my words here. Animism, that is, it seems to me magic at, at its most deepest, uh, most practical, most ground level, magic is simply an experience. It is the experience of being alive inside a world that is itself alive through and through. Um, or we could say magic is a particular form of mysticism. It's the mysticism of this world, of the body's world, uh, which is the earth. And the knowledge that everything within this breathing earth dances in reciprocity with one another um, or in curious in, inter-entangled engagements that, um, that nothing moves by a kind of straight line right angle logic, but everything is curvilinear and, um, and playful and shape-shifting, each thing crouched in readiness to become something else at any moment. But to bring this back to what we were just speaking of and the painful process of learning to read in school, you know, focusing my eyes on this simple letter B and until I heard that sound uh, in my head um, and making this a habit, I just, I want to point out to folks, if we think of, of magic, as this sense, not just of everything alive, but that everything speaks. Here, let me give you just a, a very simple exercise. I'm gonna hold up in front of the uh, camera here, uh, a piece of paper in which I have just very clumsily um, scribbled some letters. Um, and, but I don't want you to see them as letters because they're also just shapes, they're black shapes on a mostly white piece of loose leaf paper. Um, but so I want you to, I'll just flash this in front of the camera and just look at it, um, but don't, don't read what it says. Just see it as the black shapes. For, just see the black shapes on the white first, okay? Which will be easy because I'm just gonna flash it for a split second. Okay, um, are you all ready for that? Okay, here we go. Were you all able to do that? Um, was, did you see it for one thing? I hope the camera- uh, Yeah, we saw it. Oh, you um, saw it? Yeah, yeah, and you were able to just see the shapes first, right? Just Not so much. Not so much. Uh, yeah, isn't that weird? I mean, that's it. As soon as, as soon as you see these shapes, you see what they say. 
That is, they say something to you, they speak. As soon as we look at these shapes, we see what they say. This is not that different from um, our indigenous ancestors and elders stepping out of the house and seeing a spider web and focusing their eyes in on trying to find that spider and suddenly hearing the spider speaking to them. Uh, or around here in the desert, a Pueblo man stepping out from the village and coming upon a rock with crinkly lichens all over its surface and he focuses his eyes on a patch of lichen and suddenly hears the boulder talking to him. We now do it with our own scratches and scripts. Our non-writing oral ancestors were doing it with lichen patches, spider webs, bent twigs, animal tracks, tree shapes against the sky, leaves, storm clouds, mountain edges, pretty much anything we focused on could speak. And yet they spoke with their own tongues in sometimes incredibly mysterious languages. Now, once we learn to read and write with an alphabet, everything seems to speak with a human tongue. Although things that don't speak in words we tend to think they don't speak at all. Language is this exclusively human property. It's what distinguishes us from all the other animals. We've got meaningful speech, they don't, which is utter nonsense. Um, so that's just a way of pointing out that writing, you know, in, in my work and in my writing as well, <laughs> I'm not saying that writing is bad. That's been one uh, ridiculous misinterpretation of my work. Oh, Abram, he's the guy who sees that we fell away from the rest of nature by stepping into formal writing system. Well, it turns out different writing systems affect our senses in different ways. Phonetic writing, which we call the alphabet, is especially intense in the way that the letters engage us. Older writing systems like Chinese ideographs or the hieroglyphs of the Mayan culture or hieroglyphs of Egypt for that matter, where you have human forms interspersed with shapes of artifacts, houses, sunrise, sunset, monkey, uh, frog, but also rake and um, clearly human implements and human beings. So when a reader is reading such a script, she's continually reminded of language's link, not just to the human world, but to the world of monkey and feline and serpent and cloud and storm. But with an alphabet, the written letters no longer image anything out there in the surrounding earth. I see a B and I go, but I see a C, I go, C. that is the letters point me back to my own mouth. Only as we learn to read and write with an alphabet, do we get this odd idea that language is an exclusively human power and the, le the rest of the land begins to fall mute and no longer speaks at all. This is the, uh, the regime of blindness and deafness out of which uh, our work in our lifetimes is now calling us to step back inside the much wider conversation that is always going on between all things. Thunder itself as perhaps the most primordial voice of all, um, uh, but there are others. But anyway, just to say, I'm not ever saying that, lang that writing is bad even alphabetic writing. I'm a writer for God's sakes. I'm saying that writing is magic, that it's an intensely powerful magic. And if we don't recognize it as such, we tend to fall under its spell, which is the spell of spelling. <laughs> because 
those two words were originally one to spell a letter to uh, a word to arrange the letters in the right order to spell a name or the name of an animal was also to kind of cast a spell upon that animal or so it felt but as we can recognize today it was also to cast a kind of spell upon our own senses because it closed us inside a kind of cocoon of human verbiage where we look out at the rest of nature from a space closed in on itself, the space of human language. And we've conceived of the mind as something that lives in an interior world uh, inside each of us. But listen, brothers, and listen, my sisters, for our non-writing oral ancestors up until really very recently, for some of us just a generation or two, for all indigenous oral cultures, that which we associate with the mind and all that fluidity and creativity we associate with imagination and mind and think of it as living inside us, no. <laughs> it was actually something we lived inside of. It did have an interior to it, but it wasn't inside us. We were inside it, along with all the other animals and the plants. We were immersed bodily in an imagination or a psyche that was not ours, but was Earth's. And it's that that we are stepping back into at this moment, in this strange teetering moment on this whirling dervish of a planet. It's the regime of purely human self-centered mentality is cracking so many leaks and beginning to open onto the wider mind that is not ours at all, but is Earth's. And every animal dances bodily within this mind. Every plant, every mountain, every river, every cloud, which is not to say that my thoughts are the same as your thoughts, or that my awareness is the same as that of that apple tree. No, because we inhabit a common mind, but we inhabit it with our animal body or with our tree flesh. And since my body is so different from the apple tree's body, my experience of this mind is outrageously different from that apple tree's experience of mine. It's as different as our bodies are different just as your thoughts right now are richly different from mine because your body is inhabiting this vast psyche from your own angle and style. Let's say, what is this trigger? Oh. Well, so I'll tell you. <laughs> um, so it sounds as though you're I mean, there's been an awful lot of people sharing my longing, basically asking how how do we break the exclusivity of the, the spell of spelling and and rediscover um, wider conversations. And it sounds like you're saying that a lot of the uh, crises of human society that we've been studying over the last couple of months are that broader reality, that broader mind breaking through, you know, not allowing us to stay in our, in our illusions. And um, Michael Weaver is mentioning one of the conversations that you shared in advance with Dougal Tyne um, and how you were saying there that um, in the course, this is you speaking in this conversation with Dougal, in the course of my speaking, I encounter many people who are frightened of di their direct animal experience, terrified at the thought of trusting their senses of stepping into a full body, a more full-bodied way of knowing and feeling because they intuit that a more embodied and sensorial form of awareness would entail waking up to so many grievous losses and yeah i wonder if there's something to say about this tension between these crises kind of inviting us back into the wider mind but also the fear of, of, of stepping into that and the, the grief that's also been very present with us in this course 
Oh yeah, Gadzooks, there's so much to, to say about that. But I, um, to keep it fairly concise, just I think there is a terror, uh, uh, a fear of, not so much fear of mortality actually, I think it's much more a fear of being out of control and also of just noting that if I identify with my body, well, then I'm so vulnerable. I'm vulnerable to uh, the scorn of others, but I'm also vulnerable to illness, to disease, vulnerable to, um, to making mistakes, to um, fucking up and other people seeing that I fucked up. I'm just, it's just like, I don't want to just be this bodily form because it means I am down here inside of a world that is so much vaster than me. And I live at the behest of powers, of storms, of subtle, pandemics blowing through of uh, food shortages. I am out, utterly out of control. Um, and I think in many ways, what we've come to call Western civilization, which I think would be better termed alphabetized civilization, uh, so many of its uh, patterns, are set, its structures and institutions are set up precisely to enable us to avoid the difficult ambiguity of real relationship because it is terrifying to be out of control, to be, as David Fleming suggests, really present to the presence of the present moment because it's only in the presence of the present moment that one meets the other whether that other is another person, your lover, another animal that you encounter in the woods and you step out of a clutch of trees and suddenly find yourself face to face with a mother moose who stomps the ground and then you see there's a little moose behind her. And she just, I mean, encounter, the encounter with otherness only happens in the thick of the present moment. And we only have a chance to meet it when we're really present. But that means being vulnerable and it means being vulnerable to the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune and, and um, I think a lot of our civilization is set up to, uh, to help us avoid that because it's inherently ambiguous. How do I know when I'm speaking to you or when we're in conversation or just doing something together? How do I know what is that I think you're feeling is coming from me or whether it's coming from you or how much is contributed by me and how much by you? And especially if you're a moose or a raven um, uh, or a mountain, there's always that edge where I can't tell how much is me, how much is you. And so I have to walk that edge and it's an ongoing improvisation, trying to do least harm to the other while doing least harm to myself. It's, uh, it's an outrageous practice. And, um, and I think it brings so much joy, but we have to get beyond all the institutionalized forms that have become so habitual to us that enable us to hide from that, from that spontaneity, from what I associate with improvisation at every moment and what David Fleming also speaks of as congruence. Yeah. So I'd like to invite William in now uh, to shape some wind uh, on the video himself and uh, yeah because I think he wants to yeah speak mm -hmm. to his own attempts to do this. Are you there William? Yeah. 
I just had to clear a window. I um, This has bounced in and out of being relevant to the conversation, but I think it is, again, um, thinking about bird language and interpreting bird language and looking so much of bird and human language is dependent on tone of voice and body language. And what we take away from a conversation within our own species is mostly our tone of voice and body language. And so when you're reaching across species, there's that, you know, just as, just as how a human might use the same word to mean different things in different contexts. And if I, and if I put a different tone on the word, hey, I can use it to mean, you know, 10 different things. So a bird can, you know, say peep or cheap or whatever, with different body language and different tone, it, they imbue that word with a different meaning. And what you were just saying um, about not putting my own interpretation onto it, you know, or, or figuring out where is the line between that, between who I am and who they are and, you know, straddling that. And so then wondering how many other languages that's true of um, in the landscape mm. uh, and, and in the world. And it's just, it's been a constant conversation for as long as I've been, you know, learning, learning other languages and, and wondering that. Yeah, beautiful. Beautiful question, William. Um, I just wanna, you know, say that what I was trying to say is there is no figuring out where the line is because the line keeps shifting. And that's why it's, it's an ongoing apprenticeship. Uh, but to, to know another, whether it be another person or a fox um, or a raven um, or a thrush is, it seems to me involves apprenticeship, really just putting yourself there again and again, listening, listening, and picking up from your body what it picks up through some weird somatic empathy because we are made of the same stuff as every other critter and plant as well. That seeing what those sounds, what those calls uh, induce within your own felt organism, because just as you say, for other critters, for most other critters, uh, it's all body language because they never had any reason to dissociate from their body and, and into being a little mind up here who deploys the body as if it were, you know, as if by a captain in his cockpit. Um, no, it's all body language. And so birds, especially, holy cow. I mean, because these uh, folks, they navigate the invisible, uh, the wind itself, and so they're, you know, any small gusts coming from below or from above, shove them this way or that way. They are thinking with the whole of their musculature. I would say, um, you know, sometimes my thoughts become really graceful. And it's when I'm, my focus is fixed on a bird soaring and swooping in the sky. And um, because that being is thinking with its whole body in this improvisational dance with the invisible medium of wind. Um, but I think we get there, we open uh, towards such listening and we loosen our own listening by uh, kind of opening our animal ears also to our human uh, speaking and realizing how much of what William is saying or of what I'm saying just now is lives not in the dictionary definition of the words, but lives in the the melody or music of my but Dadala, but Deba Dupa speaking. And so whenever you're speaking with another person, this is different on the page. But again, 
in oral culture, when you're speaking, there's this rise and fall in your voice and your voice gets quieter and then louder at other times. And there's a cha 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 ba da kadurwa kade ka kachu kata kaburwa kada de de gadang and that is you begin to realize that most of the meaning in our speaking lives in the sound and the melody and the tone and the rhythm and that the dictionary meanings ride on the surface of that depth like waves on the surface of the sea and finally I'll just mention um, in 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 response to your question, William. But you know, for, as food for thought for all of us, I don't know. It seems like it has fallen to poets to keep alive the melodic, gestural, full-bodied um, dimension of of language and linguistic meaning. Um, particularly in the highly overly literate era of today. The poet in English who does this most exquisitely, it seems to me, who does what I'm speaking of is attending to the sound spell of words, uh, their rhythm and texture and the taste on their tongue is uh, Gerard Manley Hopkins. Do you know his work, William? I know his name, but not his work well. Okay, yeah, all right. I got to give you give you an example. Um, this is he. He's also he's a very religious Christian man. He joins the Jesuit order, uh, burns all his poetry because that's what he thought he had to do. Then discovers he can't breathe without writing poetry, so he has to get a special dispensation from the elders. Um, but this dude. Um, is also the most animistic poet in the English language because he's listening specifically to words not for their denotative meanings but for their sound and trying to move these together just get use words that sound like what they say so here's one here's one um, of his poems he says I'll try and do this here it's a poem about a stream but he's he was posted to Glasgow uh, for uh, a stretch uh, to work in the church there. And so he's listening in all the local dialect words in, in Ireland, and he's plucking words that taste good on his tongue. So this is a poem about a stream, but he's using the uh, dialect word burn for the stream. He says, this darksome burn, horseback brown, his roll rock high road roaring down in coop and in comb, the fleece of his foam flutes and low to the lake falls home. A wind puff bonnet of fawn froth turns and twindles over the broth of a pool so pitch black fell frowning, it rounds and rounds despair to drowning. Degged with dew, dappled with dew, are the groins of the braes that the brook treads through, wiry heath packs, flitches of fern, and the bead bonny ash that sits o'er the burn. What would the world be once bereft of wet and of wilderness? Let them be left, oh, let them be left, wildness and wet. Long live the weeds and the wilderness yet. That's Hopkins, but uh, but do you see what I mean? How he's working with with the sound spell. As a result of that, he he becomes so animistic um, that you know he's convinced that everything speaks. Um, ah, you know, now here's here's a fragment of one of this. He says. This, this one's hard, but I'll just tell you these images he uses. He speaks of a stone falling down a well, and he speaks of tucked strings. And it took me a while to realize that tucks, the strings of a violin are tucked in at either end, or the strings on a guitar are tucked in, yes? And he also speaks of the bow of a bell, because I had to visit a bell maker to discover that every cast iron bell, cast uh, bronze bell, has a bow 
at the top of it from which it swings and it's a kind of a bow shape. So that's the bow of the bell. All right, check this out. It says, as kingfishers, as kingfishers catch fire, dragonflies draw flame. Actually, kingfeather fishers fly like this. As kingfishers catch fire, dragonflies draw flame. As tumbled over rim in roundy wells, stones ring, like each tucked string tells, each hung bell's bow swung, finds tongue to fling out broad its name. Each mortal thing does one thing and the same. Deals out that being indoors, each one dwells. Selves goes itself, myself it speaks and spells, crying, what I do is me, for that I came. He's saying that everything speaks, not just humans, but everything, right? As kingfishers catch fire, dragonflies draw flame. As tumbled over rim in roundy wells, stones ring. Like each tucked string tells, each hung bell's bow swung, finds tongue to fling out broad its name. Each mortal thing does one thing and the same deals out that being indoors, each one dwells. Selves goes itself, myself it speaks and spells, crying, what I do is me, for that I came. That's Hopkins. So what I'm suggesting, what I'm, you know, wanting to bring across, however clumsily in our little time together, is that as simple practices, to wake up and step inside the world, the culture, the culture of place-based vernacular conviviality that David Fleming and Sean are calling us into and inviting us into. So with so much hospitality, some simple, incredibly potent practices allow just allow every now and then, allow that everything is alive. Even your shoes, even the air in the room where you sit, that each thing has its life. It's not to make it all one, no. It's to then be able to ask, what is your life, this pen, you know? How is your life interestingly different from that of my pencil or a slab of granite what is your way, your dance, your style of life? How is it different from that of a chunk of sandstone? And there are ways of asking that and getting responses, getting answers, uh, like just sleeping out under that slab of sandstone and seeing what dreams come to you there. But yes, practices, try allowing that everything is alive and two, allow that everything speaks. It's just most things don't speak in words, but they speak in gestures, in rhythms, in their ways of moving, or even in their stillness, but that they are expressive and you can receive something of that meaning with your own animal thingly body. And three, rather more involved, but way fun because it's something any child or bunch of kids can help us with is rejuvenate oral culture. That is, that sounds too big. Start telling stories again, telling stories, not reading stories to your kids from a book, but putting the book down and improvising a story with your whole body. If you don't know any stories that you wanna tell them by heart, Weave a story about that spider who herself is weaving a web there in the corner of the room above your kid's bed. Um, or a story about the wind when it blusters through the city where you live, carrying people's hats off their heads. Or stories about just what happens inside the forest edge every full moon and what goes on there. But better yet, take your kids, no, your friends out of, of doors into the land and 
weave stories face to place with the land. Begin to plant stories in the shapes and nuances of the local earth. Can just be telling a story about when you happen to meet that bear unexpectedly, or when that raven swooped by overhead and shat on your head, um, but link it to the place where it happened. This is a way, a tricky or rather magical way of opening the human mind back onto the local earth. Other, other questions? Um, yeah, I'd like to bring in a, a, a curious tension that I feel mm. between this idea of everything being alive and the topic of death, which has been one that we've been talking about. So, you know, the difference between me and my corpse, like if my corpse is in a sense alive, but it's also somehow different from me before my death. Um, and David Fleming, his entry on death is one of my favorites and to pull a brief part out of it, he says, expressing faith in the sanctity of human life is a license in a series of little well-intentioned self-evident steps to kill the ecology that supports it. The large scale system relying on its size and complexity and making an enemy of death, which should be its friend, joins a battle which it cannot win. In systems thinking, death is sacred. So I just wonder what death means if, I mean, if, if, if we're saying that everything is alive, even in a sense corpses are alive, then, then what is death? Important question. Death, it seems to me, um, inevitably, uh, as an ecologist and for us ecologically minded bumpkins, um, death is a metamorphosis. It's a shape shift. Um, the idea that death is an end um, seems to link itself actually very much to the sense that, well, the body is one thing and the mind is something else, myself is something else, my soul is something radically other than the body. Because if one allows that the body itself is just the uh, outward comportment and display of the self or the soul. The body doesn't end. Uh, it just obviously is transforming and it transforms in all sorts of nifty ways that feed back into the soils, that feed back into the water that feed back into the air. Uh, um, our brothers and sisters who are now opting for cremation, um, this is also a very old indigenous practice and what departs as flame is fed back to the sun and to the stars. And what departs as ash is fed back to the, to the soil. And we all know that at that moment of death, something departs as breath and dissolves back into the wider atmosphere of the cosmos. No, of this local cosmos we call Earth, whose atmosphere is born of all of us creatures interbreathing with one another and interbreathing with the plants. And that's a magic that bears mentioning that it turns out all this oxygen that we animals need to fire our metabolism is what all the plants are breathing out. And what we then breathe out is what all the plants need for their photosynthetic metabolism. So we inhale some of this invisible stuff and we circulate it within us and we transform it within our limbs and alchemized breathe out 
the carbon infused atmosphere that all these plants then take up within themselves. And what they then breathe out is what all us animals breathe in. Talk about reciprocity. It is the uttermost, most magical reciprocity. At the heart of the presence of the present moment being born is our reciprocity with the plants, with one another, with the soils, with the oceans. All of which is to say, coming back to your question, that our life is nothing but an internal expression of Earth's life, of the biospheric metabolism in which we're all utterly embedded and ensconced. So that at the moment of death, however else we think of it, I think we can begin to recognize that it is a moment when a sort of central equilibrium of my small body begins to break down and open outward, turning inside out, feeding back into the larger flows within this much broader spherical metabolism from which all of us were born at the moment of birth. So I think it is helpful to think of this body as our small body and the earth as our larger body or the larger life of which our lives are an internal expression. And at the moment of death, we are this smaller life opens back into and feeds into and returns to the much broader life of which we're a part. This huge spherical physiology in which we're all embedded and the apple tree is embedded in it as well and the spider. Um, as soon as one brings earth into the equation in this way, then I, I do think many uh, possibilities open uh, because the life to which we return is, it is spherical, it floats among the stars, kind of like a heaven, it's quite mysterious. But when you realize that your life is internal to this much broader life, then, then um, well, certain things that, uh, experiences that our comrades or colleagues less perhaps less ecological than ourselves in their thinking, things that they attribute sort of magical uh, ideas to, they speak of out of the body experiences. Well, we all have strange experiences somewhat akin to that. I have had them very vivid, but for me, they're not out of the body experiences. Just because I'm gazing up at the crown of, of an oak tree, uh, and watching it intently and suddenly see myself from there, from that top of that tree where I, my eyes are fixed. Um, um, that's not an out of the body experience. That's just me moving out from my smaller body into my larger body. So what others call out of the body experiences are more perhaps precisely and helpfully thought of as into the body experiences. If, as it is here today, I'm gazing out the window and there's a, um, a canopy of cloud um, that is just spreading off toward the horizon. I wish I could show it to you, but I won't. Um, so there's like this dense topography underfoot of the land, but there's this other dense topography overhead of the clouds, a few of them right overhead, but then the gradient gets more dense as it stretches out toward the horizon, the Western horizon. And as I look out above the ground under the canopy of clouds, I am looking into my own depths, into the depths of my own larger flesh. I live down here inside this being. So, um, so uh, yeah, I'm carrying this in all sorts of directions, but to bring it back, I simply want to suggest that 
that death is a metamorphosis in which we also spread back into those broader, wider life. Yeah. Out of which, it seems to me, we were all born. We were all born at birth. If I may say, it helps me make sense a few years ago when my dad passed. Um, he was on Long Island on the East Coast. I was in Colorado on a function with my, my kids. Um, and I took off for a day, went up into the mountains um, to explore and was coming down, driving my car um, and was just looking for something good to listen to on the radio. And on came, um, oh, uh, a classical work, the Pallavetsian dances that was the first uh, uh, album my father ever gave me. And, um, and so it, it sort of, it was really sweet to hear that, but it was just ending and then came on other music I didn't want to listen to. So I turned the dial and there was this song starting up. Most of us have heard, I'd never paid it any attention whatsoever. Um, it has in it the words, when you fall, if you look, then you will find, if you're lost and you look, then you will find me time after time. Uh, if you fall, I will catch you. I'll be waiting time after time. Not a song I particularly liked, although as I'm listening to the words, suddenly it was my father's voice. And my father was saying, if you fall, I'll catch you. I'll be waiting time after time. If you're lost and you look, you'll find me. But it was his voice, which was nothing like the singers that I'm hearing in my ears. And the tears started pouring from my eyes. I realized he's leaving. Um, now we thought he, he, he had been a, a bit sick, but the doctors had said he could live for another two, four years. Um, um, there was, but it was, I started crying so intensely. I couldn't see the road, pulled over to the side of the road. I had now no question whatsoever, my father, was leaving, picked up my phone, called to New York to my family house, but we're in the high mountains, so there was no, no, there was no phone reception. Dried my eyes as best I could, drove further down the highway, got off at the first exit, tried to call, no phone reception. I'm still crying hugely, more than I've ever felt tears pouring out of my eyes so, so fast and so much got back on the highway, but in my dismay, I got back on it going the wrong direction, hadn't realized, but we were heading back up the mountains a bit. <clears throat> and the phone rang on the seat next to me. I picked it up, it was my sister. David, you're not gonna believe this. Daddy just died. I said, I know, he was just visiting me right here. And she said, what? So this is half a continent away and I can't, make head or tail of that, except, oh, of course, um, of course, because the continent is, is our larger body and the earth is our larger flesh. And I'm sure many of you have had similar and analogous experiences, but it was just an experience of my dad as he was opening outward dropping in to speak with me with a wisdom a little beyond what he had carried in life as he was beginning to discover, oh my God, I'm not disappearing. I'm becoming vast. I'm becoming a part of everything. So since you asked, that's a sort of a response. Thank you. And um, Bertus in the Netherlands was asking, you know, you didn't use the word spirit as you talked about that is that a word you were kind of consciously avoiding or one that um that has a meaning for you ah that's a good question um i happily use the word spirit uh, it just has it has resonances that i didn't necessarily want to have to unpack here but i'll just say that for me i take very seriously, the simple truth that the word spirit comes from the Latin spiritus, a root it shares with the word respiration. 
spiritus originally means a breath or a gust of wind. Just like our word psyche, from which we speak of psychology and psychiatry, comes from an old Greek word, psuche. The verb psuchein originally meant to breathe or to blow like the wind. A psyche, the noun, meant a gust of wind or a breath of air. Like the Latin word for the soul, anima, from which we get unanimous, being of one soul, or animal, an ensouled being. Anima comes from where? Well, it comes from an older Greek word, animos, which means wind. So for me, the spirit is something mysterious indeed, very strange, because it's utterly invisible. But we are, I feel, quite confused and mistaken when we, when we assume that the spirit is also intangible. It is as tangible as the wind blowing against my face when I step out of this, of my door. It is as intangible as, as the air between us and as invisible as the air. But um, we have this propensity in our goofy civilization to think that the invisible is somewhere else, that the invisible world is another world somewhere outside this one. We, we miss what the word itself says, that the invisible is just like it says, is in the visible. So for me, the spirit is the air, the wind, the breath, the atmosphere that we now know is born of our interbreathing with one another, with the other animals, with the plants, and with the soils, and with, with the oceans, percolating into existence this layer of the planet inside of which we walk and dwell and live. So one of the goofs in our common language, we say that we live on the earth. We, on, here on earth, this is happening or that's happening. We live on the, we don't because the air is entirely a part of earth and it stretches up many miles beyond those clouds. We live down here in the earth or in the earth, we might say, taking a letter I, which you might think of as a kind of stand-in for the upright spine of this animal who stood up on its hind legs, taking the letter I for the self and putting it in the middle of our planet's name, E-A-I-R-T-H, in order to say that the I is in the air. I am immersed in the air, A-I-R. And the air is entirely a part of the earth, E-A-I-R-T-H. And it sounds somewhat Scottish when you say it, which is another plus. So yes, the spirit. And, and, but it just seems to me the spirit is not ours also. It's, it's Earth's. And um, if I may link to something very simple, I know we're out of time just to say that to feel the Earth as, as flesh, as this immense spherical metabolism in which we're ensconced of which each of us is an internal expression, as is the spider, as is the clump of sagebrush, um, is also to notice that each place within the earth, each region, each bioregion, is a unique tissue or organ of this living world. And um, just as it you know, if, if the cells in my right kneecap were trying to uh, act and behave the same as the cells, the cells in my left lung. Uh, so when we try and unfurl a culture here with McDonald's on each corner, just like McDonald's on each corner in the Hudson River estuary, <laughs> the body breaks down, that each place each bioregion, 
the high desert valley where I live is utterly unique. And um, each region calls forth, each organ of the earth calls for its own modality of culture um, as an expression of it, a modality of culture that blesses it and honors it. And um, so I think that's also a big part of what, what we're on about. If, if the earth is alive, it, its organs are very diverse and yet depend upon that diversity for any one of them to flourish. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Well, as you say, we're out of time. Um, and uh, yeah, so there is thank yous and, and the likes uh, appearing in the chat to acknowledge your contribution. So um, I don't know whether you're whether you're seeing the chat, but um, but yeah, there's just a, a torrent of thank yous. <laughs> Great. Um, and um, yeah, I don't know if there's, a, if there's anything more you feel needs to be said, or whether that feels like our, our closing. Well, I feel very. Um, I'm just delighted uh, to speak. God, I speak in so many places, and before the pandemic, yeah, around the world. Um, and so many continents and um, and yet I have to say the chance to talk to this group was feeling incredibly significant to me because uh, it felt like what David Fleming had uh, found, cultivated within himself or stumbled into also um, just by accident. Uh, has everything to do with what with what is most called for, I feel, calling through us, what what the earth itself is calling through us. And um, and so I trust that each of you uh, also knows, has a sense of the delicious responsibility that goes with this. And um, um, I'll reiterate again, just beginning to tell stories with your whole body again, not just indoors, but outdoors, perhaps where that story or those events happen to you, but gathering friends for the telling, letting not just the page, but once again, letting the land hold some of our stories, stories that we don't write down. And so we don't steal it from the place where that story happened or has its relevance, but we tell it with our whole gesturing body there in the land. And we gather people for the telling in the right time of year. This is beginning to happen. And it's something I'm deeply dedicated to. Um, if it tickles your toes or makes some quirky sense, um, do check out more of my work, the books that Sean spoke of uh, the Spell of the Sensuous and Becoming Animal, my, the website of my organization, the Alliance for Wild Ethics, has some stuff there, but I'm a bit of a Luddite, and so I'm still befuddled so much by the computer digital world. But it might be helpful to end with a simple poem, if I might. Uh, uh, if there's a burning question, I, 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 I want to just open it to if somebody has something really burning, um, I, I don't feel like I have to run. Um, so feel free, but I'm just gonna choose in this moment a poem. Hmm. Yeah, I'll offer up two from Rilke. One, uh, this one, I'm sure some of you have heard translated into English by uh, Joanna Macy, actually. Dear darkening ground, you've endured so patiently the walls we've built. Perhaps you'll grant the cities one more hour and the churches and synagogues too. And those who labor, will you let their work grip them another five hours or seven? 
before you become forest again and ocean and widening wilderness in that hour of unspeakable terror when you take back your name from all things. Just give me a little more time. I want to love the things as no one has thought to love them until they are worthy of you and real. And then, and then this one, which has everything to do with what we were just sharing about. The spirit as the wind and the breath the atmosphere and the simple fact that climate change whatever we think of it it could also be understood as the simple consequence of our forgetting the mystery and sacredness of the unseen medium of air and treating it as a as a perfect dump site for all the chemical effluents of our industries, all the byproducts spewing into the air. And whatever dissipates as smoke and dissolves into the invisible, we think out of sight, out of mind. But for our oral ancestors, that which dissipates as smoke and dissolves, dissolves into the invisible air is by that very gesture entering into the mind, wind mind of the world from whence we all drink steadily. Climate change, a simple consequence of forgetting, forgetting the sacredness of the invisible air, the atmosphere, the breath of the world. Um, here's Rilke, last poem. He says, ah, not to be cut off, not through the slightest partition shut out from the law of the stars. The inner, what is it if not intensified sky hurled through with birds and deep with the winds of homecoming. Ah, not to be cut off, not to be shut out, not through the slightest partition from the law of the stars. The inner, what is it if not intensified sky hurled through with birds and deep with the winds of homecoming? Thank you, guys. <laughs> Thank you, David. We will uh, doubtless be in touch again. And it's been an absolute joy and privilege. Great. Thanks, man. Thank you for joining us in another episode of The Poetry of Predicament. This podcast is produced by Dean Walker and the Living Resilience Alliance. Living Resilience exists to offer transformative support and resources to the collapse-aware and collapse-acceptant communities around the world. Our sole purpose is to curate and offer coaching, support groups, courses, and events that assist people in expanding their core skills, competencies, and capacities for facing a troubled, predicament-laden, yet still ineffably miraculous world.